What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Hidden Forces with me, Dimitri Kafinas. Today, we speak with Dr. Eric Schott. Dr. Schott is founding director of the Eichen Institute for Genomics and Multiscale Biology and chair of the Department of Genetics and Genomic Sciences at the Eichen School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. During the course of his 20-year career, Dr. Schott has built genetics and systems biology groups at Merck, the Computational Biology Group at Rosetta, served as co-founder of Sage BioNetworks, as Chief Science Officer of Pacific Biosciences, and now as founder of Semaphore. He has published more than 300 peer-reviewed papers in leading scientific journals and has contributed to a number of discoveries relating to the genetic basis for common human diseases such as diabetes, obesity, and Alzheimer's. In this episode, we explore the information technology of biology, DNA, the world of genomics, where big data looms large. We begin by mapping the territory of the human genome, exploring the pathways of disease, understanding the ways in which complex genetic combinations express themselves as phenotypes, like height, bone structure, intelligence, personality. How are these traits coded for? What are the instructions our body uses to repair a damaged cell, to grow new arteries, regulate our appetite, or start us down the path of puberty? And what happens when these instructions are damaged? How can the smallest difference in the order of life's code make all the difference for our success, our happiness, and even our very survival? 50 years have passed between the discovery of the double helix and the mapping of the first human genome. What progress have we made in the 50 years since? How has our ability to sequence new genomes, our genome, created a paradigm shift for the future of humanity? What is the role of big data and artificial intelligence in finding the correlations to treat malignancies, prevent disease, and improve the fate of our children? What is the promise? What are the perils? What stands in the way of us and this incredible superhuman future? As always, you can gain access to reading lists put together by me ahead of every episode by visiting the show's website at hiddenforcespod.com. Lastly, if you are listening to the show on iTunes or Android, make sure to subscribe. If you like the show, write us a review. And if you want a sneak peek into how the sausage is made or for special storylines told through pictures and questions, then like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod. And now, let's get right to this week's conversation. So, Dr. Eric Schott, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful having you on. Actually, our last episode of Hidden Forces was on the qualitative universe, kind of looking at the limitations of data and what the phenomenological world of sort of interpretation and tuition and everything. But here is the exact opposite. We're going to look at the promise, the world of data, of big data, specifically insofar as genomics and data science is concerned. I think before we start, I want to let our audience know, now you are a pure mathematician. Correct. Which is awesome and fascinating, and many of our audience will appreciate that from episode 11 with Ray Monk, where we talked about philosophical mathematics. You also have a PhD in biomathematics, which is something like computational mathematics. Yeah, applied mathematics. Applied mathematics within the context of biology. Yes. Is that fair to just say that that is a way of looking at the human organism or organisms or organic life in general as information processors? Yeah, it's looking at living systems more generally and you know the myriad of data that makes a living system live and how are all those interconnected parts, how do they function, how can we model that, how can we you know build predictive model simulations to learn more about you know the operation of those systems so that we can you know better tune them think about it from the standpoint of treating diseases, preventing diseases, and so on. Okay, fascinating. Well, if we have time, I want to ask you some more questions about that, and some will be peppered in during the course of this interview. But So I think to begin with, I want to ask you this. What is genomics? Which, for me, genomics is a study of the human genome, but what can you give us a better sort of definition? What is genomics? Yeah, so genomics is you know studying the DNA that we're all born with, all living systems you know possess some amount of DNA that really serves as the blueprint 
for everything that's going on in your system. So, you know, when you start with a, a single egg and a sperm that gets fertilized, there's two copies of DNA, one from mom, one from dad. Those come together and actually define Those the, are the complexity. Chromosomes. Those are the chromosomes, and they define you know all of the genes, the proteins that get generated that serve as the machines that carry out little functions in the cells that that enable the cells to build up you know constellations of cells and ultimately tissues and ultimately organs and ultimately these organs that communicate with one another that you know ultimately give rise to the you know to the complex being that you see sitting in front of you. Okay, so then to go further on that. What is a gene? Because I think when most people think of genes, they think of them as these sort of like, you know, single units that exist somewhere in the body. And you hear a lot right. of people say, what's the gene for, for height or what's the gene for uh, diabetes? But that's uh, obviously that misses really the point. So let's talk a little bit about that. What, what is a gene and, and what does that look like? It's a you know, little more complicated concept than it may seem. So you in humans, you're born with three billion bases of, of DNA, and that's spread across 23 chromosomes. And so think of that DNA as a, an encyclopedia. And so in that encyclopedia, you have you know major chapters or themes, so those would be the chromosomes. And then within each of those chapters, you have words that then string into sentences that, that kind of convey meaning. And that's what the genes are sort of doing. So what genes are are these units within the DNA that uh, gets transcribed by machinery in the cell to produce the proteins that carry out all of these functions our cells need to survive. So that's the simplest sort of way to think about it. There, there are now, you know, that, that was the view back in the old uh, dogma of biology, back when we thought, you know, DNA went to RNA, went to proteins. We now know that some RNA, so these are the, the RNA is transcribed off the DNA as, a, as the template from which the protein gets made. They're like a reader of the DNA? Like they're... Yeah, they're a reader. So there are special molecules, proteins that attach to the DNA, and, and then they actually attach where the genes are located. So they have this ability to recognize, which is pretty amazing, where they should attach, where the gene starts, and then it actually transcribes a copy of that DNA in the form of what we call RNA. And then it's that RNA that's then lifted off the DNA, and it goes into the ribosomes where they make the protein. And when things go wrong in that process, that's where you can get something like cancer, right? Right. So diseases then are caused by, so again, go back to the book analogy. So consider a gene as a, as a sentence that's conveying some important meaning function of what should be happening in the system. And just imagine that now you go in and you change certain letters or words in the sentence. You have the potential to fundamentally alter the meaning of that sentence. Well, the same is true in DNA. If you get a mutation in the single letters that make up the gene, you know, that can cause the protein that ultimately gets transcribed to have an aberrant function, or it can destroy its function. Or as is the case of cancer, it amplifies its function to a point where it's very not normal, like the cells just start proliferating and can't control themselves. So exactly right. So under normal conditions, these are being transcribed, everything's working in harmony, but certain mutations can occur that disrupt the system. So when the body looks to repair itself, it looks, it, it references its genome. It references it, its DNA. It looks to see the blueprints to see what do I need to create here. And then it, it proceeds to create that if it needs to repair. Exactly. Something. And so cancer is a situation where the blueprints or the information that the body has, has available to it in its genes, in its DNA, is compromised. And when it proceeds to try to build organic tissue off of that model, it creates something that is is malignant, which is the cancer, yeah, or it, a tumor that's benign or whatever, some tissue that shouldn't be there. Yeah, more or less, that's correct. So certain changes, so we have what we call oncogenes, which are genes that if they're expressed proteins that occur in too high a number, they cause the cell to grow without limitation. So you don't want mutations in those genes to get too active because then cancer results. And then you have tumor suppressor genes, which are genes that keep all of that regulatory information in check for the cell to prevent it from growing out of control, and those functions can be destroyed. And so if you destroy the tumor suppressor, you allow the oncogenes to proliferate and they you know, cause things to, to go crazy. Okay. And there's a tremendous amount of complexity, obviously, in the gene. And there's another thing that's interesting, which is that, of course, different genes have different lengths and different amounts of information because they aren't one single unit. They are comprised of different nucleotide base pairs. Yeah, that's correct. In fact, again, if you go back to the sort of the sentence analogy for a gene, you know, the, the way a gene gets transcribed, 
uh, there are these sort of fundamental units called exons. So those, so you can equate those to, to words. And so those are being transcribed, but the complexity of the system allows some exons to be removed and some to be put in for under normal functions. It's pretty amazing. So as the, as the RNA is being transcribed from the DNA template, uh, under certain conditions, it can say, you know, we don't want this word. We don't want this exon in, in this sentence. So toss it out. Or we want to make sure this one's in there. So there can be variations in the gene and the functioning of the protein that, that's needed to adapt to whatever conditions you're facing. So the complexity is, even with at the gene level, is pretty high. But it's important to note that complex diseases like cancer or diabetes or obesity or Alzheimer's, those are caused not by a single gene typically or a single problem or a mutation in the gene, they're caused by a constellation of changes over many genes. So again, it's disruption, you know, not at the sentence level, but at the chapter level. And it's that, you know, sort of more network uh, oriented. So think of each gene as communicating with each other on what level should I be expressed at? Who do I join forces with to make this machine work better or to stop this machine from functioning? So it's this network that kind of goes out of control, mm. not a single gene. Exactly. The complexity. And the same is true also for certain traits like height. And of course, some mutations are beneficial. And so that's the way we evolve and everything else. The same mechanism that causes cancer in some way or other, maybe next, yeah, is part of Absolutely. the evolutionary process. Absolutely. All right, so I hope that sort of gave our audience uh, just a basic template. So now let's get into the technology of genomics, which is where you reside. And so I guess, let me ask you first, what is the problem that Semaphore, your company, is trying to resolve or solve? So the problem Semaphore is trying to solve, address, is how do we better understand the human genome and the changes that occur in that genome that either protect you from disease, enhance wellness, think cognitive functioning, all the favorable things, but that also can cause you know, bad things like Alzheimer's, diabetes, cancer. And what we note is we have the ability now to sequence entire genomes in people for low cost at population scale, but what we're missing is the high dimensional data around people to understand what are those changes in DNA doing? What are they causing to happen? So you need phenotypes. You know, so think of when you go to the doctor's office, your your blood pressure, your glucose. The phenotype levels. is the way in which the genotype expresses itself and exactly. the way we experience it. Perfect. So that's exactly right. And if you think about the number of phenotypes that can exist they're in the hundreds of thousands to millions. So we consider, you know, phenotypes could be the expression levels of a given protein in a certain part of your body. And there are 20 to 30,000 different proteins or variations of proteins that are going on. So all the different combinations are pretty enormous. Think of all the epigenetic changes. These are chemical modifications that can be induced by the environment to change the DNA. Those can occur by the millions. Think of all the environmental exposures, you know, the pathogens you're exposed to, viruses, bacteria, pollution levels, pollen counts. Like all of that information molds like who you are and how your genome's expressed. And if you want to get to a complete understanding of disease, you need to have all of that information built up around populations of individuals, and that's Semaphore's mission. Just to clarify something, epigenetics, because that's become more of a buzzword in the last few years, yeah. more and more people are becoming aware of it. Is epigenetics the study of the way in which genes turn on or off certain functions or characteristics based on accommodative environments? Yeah, I and mean, that's close. It, mutations or changes in DNA are actually changing the fundamental letters in the sequence of the DNA, and then that can be passed on to your kids and their kids and so on. It's a heritable unit. Epigenetic modifications, you're not changing the letter itself. You're chemically modifying the letter to sort of have a different kind of flavor. And that, That's fascinating. that chemical modification can be induced by environmental exposures. So you like endocrine disruptors or a common environmental toxin, you know, a lot of supermarkets use it to spray off their fruit. That can induce chemical modifications to the DNA that it, you're exactly right, can turn on and off genes in, in certain programs to, to wreak havoc on the system. So it's, a, it's an interesting kind of change that we've evolved with to allow a more rapid adaption to the environment to kind of tune what's going on in the system. Amazing. Isn't it amazing? Amazing. Uh, and is it also true that given sufficient generations, epigenetic changes become genetic? Yeah, and that's been the big you know, finding. You know, this must have been, you know, I don't know, maybe seven, seven or eight 
years ago, maybe even a decade, one of the biggest uh, findings to, to come up, and my colleague, you know, Dr. Skinner, Washington State, was one of the first to do this. They found that endocrine disruptors, so this is a common environmental toxin that uh, induces these chemical modifications to the DNA, uh, can actually be passed on to you know, future generations. So what they were able to show is those things that were environmentally induced were then passed on to future generations and the same sort of molecular change that induced in the primary affected was passed on to generations. And that was never thought to have occurred. In fact, we used to joke about the Lamarckian evolution that you remember the giraffe's neck is yeah. long because it reaches for the trees and everybody would laugh at that now as that's not how evolution works. But what we're seeing for the first time is absolutely environmental changes can induce these modifications that can be passed on, and they will have an evolutionary effect. Lamarck had the theory that it was a little earlier, but also competing with Darwin, right? I mean, he was Correct. around the same time. Yeah. And what about telomeres? Because that's something I've also learned about in, in recent years. I think that's even even more recent in some ways in the popular culture, to the extent that it's popular, is telomeres. Tell us a little bit about that, because, and I'm asking about these questions why for two reasons for our audience to know. One is I want to highlight the complexity, right. because I want people to appreciate that there is sort of the what we would like, and then the reality of getting there, which is extremely difficult. And the second point is sort of related to this, which is as we get deeper into what you do, you're dealing with data, you're dealing with looking at genetics, epigenetics, things like telomeres, every every piece of data that you're coming in, you're, you're trying to match that to phenotypic expressions, the ex exactly. how it expresses, whether it's as traits, characteristics, or disease, and you're trying to find correlations. So I just want to express that point that you're collecting massive amounts of data, and we don't even know fully how all these systems operate with each other. Yeah, and that's a good point. And so things like uh, epigenetic modifications, telomeres, they all sort of relate to how is DNA managed in the in the system, in the cell. And so DNA, I think it's 3 billion letters long. So it's pretty, pretty long. And the only way to efficiently store that is to kind of wrap it, is to kind of compress it down, wrap it around proteins that we called histones to make these uh, chromosomes. And then the chromosomes get capped with these telomeres, which sort of ensure the integrity of the chromosome and what's come out in you know again the last decade is that you know the telomere length is sort of intermittently or intimately intertwined with uh, aging so the, the hypothesis is that as you age damage is occurring telomere lengths decrease the stability of the chromosomes are then in jeopardy, and as time goes on, it sort of loses its coherence, and and you know the cells ultimately function at a suboptimal mm -hmm. level, suboptimal enough to where we you know you it's like a protective age. of the gene, of the the genome or the gen whatever, right. It's, the, it's the protective of the chromosomes that contain chromosomes. all of the genes right. in that stretch of DNA, and so you want healthy long, you know, yeah. telomeres to maintain. You know, that kind of robustness. And again, the aging process or toxins in the environment, like those are things that can degrade, not only mutate the DNA, but can shorten the telomeres and, and basically progress you. We now distinguish between your chronological age and your biological age. So you could be mm. a 30 year old mm. chronologically aged individual, but your molecular states look like you're 40 or 50. Mm. Like, how does that happen? So that could be through your increased exposures to toxins that are mutating your mm. DNA, shortening your telomeres and so on, and causing sort of aberrant functions in the, in the pathways that you need for normal functioning. And what you're also getting at, which is that diseases like cancer are really the body's inability to keep up with the repairs with the damage. They aren't able to keep up. Because yeah, we're constantly, a, we have can, we're developing cancerous cells all the time in our bodies. That's a great point, and uh, and it is this this balance, the steady state that your your system gets into and can maintain the appropriate pushback on you know cells that maybe become more aberrant, and so your immune system activates and gets rid of those. And if you destroy that imbalance, you suppress those systems. You're exactly right. It now provides an opportunity to proliferate those those cells, and that's one of the most exciting components of the immunotherapies that you're hearing in the news today, it's what, what is that doing? That's amping up your, your system's immune system to attack these cells that are growing out of control that have a, a specific signature. The body can sense that they're cancer-like. They shouldn't be there. And what the immunotherapies do now is they boost your immune system's ability to both recognize those cells and destroy them. We're aiding intelligently the immune system to exactly. recognize an attack. Yep. All right. So 
And that leads us into a really good question. So where are we now in terms of data science, big data, and uh, genomics, and sort of pairing all those together towards uh, creating treatment modalities? Where are we at this moment before we get into where we could go? Yeah, so where we're at at the moment is we've dumped a tremendous amount of money into sequencing many genomes across many populations, you know, disease groups across a whole array of diseases, you know, different populations, well individuals. Uh, you know, the thing to note is sequencing, DNA sequencing technology is the only technology known to humankind that has moved at a super Moore's law speed. So right. think, you know, faster, exponentially faster than semiconductors and, you know, memory and so on. Like it's, a, it's amazing. And so that's moved with such amazing speed where the cost has dropped so fast that we've been able to literally sequence, you know, millions of individuals now. So, so that's good. So that gives us- At a us quintupling rate. Why is that? Is that correct? It's about five times. Yeah, something on that order. Why is that? What is the, the, the reason for that? Oh, yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. I think it's sort of just the emergent, the bringing together of many different types of technology that have been able to benefit the, you know, you know, the carrying out of molecular assays like sequencing DNA or sequencing RNA, that I think that space has benefited from all of the nanofabrication, you know, nanotechnology, the semiconductor industry, like all of those technologies sort of being brought together in a synergistic way. What was the cost? Like a hundred, am I incorrect? Was it a hundred million dollars in 2001 to sequence the human genome? More on the order of a billion. Of a billion dollars. To three billion. And when we hear the human genome, what we really mean is one person's genome, some lab rat. And not only is it one person's genome, but it wasn't even the whole genome. So we okay. talk about, you know, that the human genome has been sequenced. And at that time, there's probably 20 to 30 percent of the genome that was not and now it costs could under not be addressed by that technology. And now it costs under a thousand dollars. And now it costs, yeah, just about on thousand. the order of a thousand. That is pretty remarkable, right? Because how Very many years? Remarkable. How many years? I mean, is that's that? 16 uh, years. You know, the first paper was published in what, 2001? Yeah. So in like, a, like 15 years. Yeah. The way I see it, there are two sort of major bottlenecks, and it's not clear to me which one is the bigger bottleneck at the moment or which one will be. I can I could guess, but there, one of them is the, is the data, which is sequencing and acquiring, not just sequencing. I, that's an interesting point as well. There's the sequencing, which is getting new data right. and new and better data. And then another part is getting existing data that's mm. locked here or protected over there. And then there is the software side. Right. Um, Correct. So, where are we there? And tell us a little bit about what you're doing with that. Yeah. So I would say that you know, first of all, while we've made amazing progress on the DNA side, where you know the fundamental problem we're faced with today, in my opinion, is building up enough other types of data around individuals where we have that genomic information where we can link it together. And so today we simply don't have, while well, all this money has gone into sequencing many, many individuals, if you look at the studies that have been done, it was you know, looking at obesity and diabetes and heart disease and, and cancer. But those individuals weren't sequenced like exhaustively. They were sequenced, do you have diabetes or do you not have diabetes? So a really minimal amount of information was generated on those individuals and not enough to really get at the complexity of what's going on. So one of the fundamental problems we have today are what, you know, it's building up a big enough, you know, information store around individuals to hook, you know, to hook the DNA up to. So think of, so what data do I mean? Well, I mean molecular data. So think of you know metabolite levels, you know the vitamins you take. Think of protein levels, you know the machines in your cells that are doing all the work. Think of the epigenetic changes and so on. Like like we don't have exhaustive amounts of data. Are built there no up. standards, or were there no standards? There's no. Uh, I think it's the technology is moving so fast that it's only been within the last few years that we've had the capability to generate that information. So that's molecular. Now think of we want to get more to the physiologic. Like what do we want to do? We want to hook up all this molecular information to the physiologic information so that we can understand how they interrelate and how we can push on certain parts of the molecular system to impact the physiology, to prevent disease, to enhance functioning, and so on. So we, so think on the physiology side, we've been pretty limited. Think about when you would go to the doctor's office 20 years ago. It's a doctor with a stethoscope on listening you know, to your heart. Today, we have a myriad of molecular tests that are run. We have imaging technologies. Mm -hmm. We have advanced devices that we can wear on us that are monitoring us longitudinally. So we're in this revolution as well of being able to generate really high-dimensional longitudinal data on our physiological states. 
And that's the kind of data that we need to build in mass to complement the big DNA that's been generated. So if anything, it's not the acquiring the data is less of the issue. A bigger part of the issue is organizing and sorting through what's out there. And also, sure. I mean, from what I understand, informed consent's a real issue. So a lot of the of this legacy data, what percentage of that yeah. is something where you could go back and uh, contact the patient and get an update and update their records? Yeah, very, very minimal. In fact, last year we published uh, one of the largest genome studies ever. We looked at 600,000 genomes, paper we published in Nature Biotechnology, and the idea was to look over these 600,000 genomes that we went to all everybody on the planet who was generating DNA data and said, hey, let's, can you be part of our study? And the study was, can we identify individuals who harbor very deleterious changes in their DNA that should have caused catastrophic illness when they were a kid? Should, they should have been dead before adulthood, but they're in their 40s and 50s, and they're fine, and they've never manifested the disease. So the medical textbook says, should be dead, but here they are, alive, never had the disease. So however they're buffering the disease, mm -hmm. however the nature allowed them to counteract it, is the therapeutic. So it's a way to identify immediately a therapeutic that could benefit whole disease groups. So we do this screen over 600,000 genomes for these special individuals that we call unexpected heroes, right? And we identified around 13 candidates. We weren't able to go and recontact one of them. Legally. Uh, legally, because mm -hmm. the way the consent, like all of the different studies that were done, the types of consents they had just didn't allow for that. And in cases where the consents were there, there were serious concerns about privacy, about going back to somebody and relaying this information where the institution didn't want to take on the risk of being sued. You're bringing up another huge point, which is privacy and yeah. regulations and all that. So what, before we go to there, because I do want to ask you about that, how many human genomes have we sequenced? So there are many different measures of uh, what it means to sequence a human genome, and so it's complicated. We have <laughs> what we call whole genome sequencing, which is kind of probably what you're thinking when you say you get your whole genome sequence, and that's literally the attempt to sequence your entire genome. But you don't necessarily have to sequence your entire genome to get at the most actionable stuff we can sequence just the genes. Because when you say sequence the whole human genome, do you include the redundant parts in that? Absolutely. So those of us who work in information theory and network, you know, network reconstructions, like we want it all because even though the genes, the protein coding parts of the genome comprise maybe 3% of the genome. So what's the other 97% doing? Well, they're coding for non-protein coding genes. They're coding for regulatory regions. Remember when I talked about the, the proteins that bind to transcribe the gene off the template? So those regions are the pretty RNA. important. Uh, you know, so they so so they have functions that if you really want to understand how this network's put together, you need to know it. But for medically actionable, like for hooking up what changes in DNA have the most profound impact on disease. You know, the protein coding component of the genome is, is pretty informative. And it's, you know, whereas a whole genome sequence at clinical death is going to cost you, you know, $1,500 to $2,500 on uh, an exome, which is the protein coding part of the genome we would sequence, is about, um, you know, three or $400. Mm -hmm. So it's still a big enough price difference where the bang for the buck is will be done there. So on the whole genome sequencing side, we've maybe sequenced on the order of 100 to 200,000 genomes. On the whole exome side, easily now into the into the low millions, mm. and on the sort of genotyping side, which gives you kind of covers all the common variation that would exist in the population, you know, tens of millions. So when I hear the number ten million, which is sort of the target that has been set for being the sufficient number of genomes sequenced to get us to a place where we can make important, meaningful insights. Yeah. Where did the number come from? Where are we in terms of that number? And right. So it's a good question. And I think the 10 million number, again, think of it in terms of if all we have are 10 million genomes sequenced without all the data built up around those individuals, the data is not useless, but it's far, far, far less useful. If you have high dimensional data built up around those 10 million individuals plus their genome, like it, it, that's what's going to transform our understanding of disease. And why is that? So think of something like cancer. So first, let's go to information theory. So think of you know the the Googles and and the Amazons. Look at the papers they published on you know deep learning, machine learning algorithms. Like what does it take to derive from high dimensional feature data? What sample size do you need to really have these methods 
work their magic and pull out the most predictive features that are like amazing. And it's on the order of like 10 to 20,000, sample sizes of 10 to 20,000. Mm. So now think of cancer, many hundreds of different types of cancer. In a given type of cancer, there'll be many different subtypes of cancer. And so if you want to get 10 to 20,000 people who are homogeneous enough with respect to a certain type or subtype mm. of cancer, you need 10 million people to sample mm. from to get to that number. And, and now think about you want to go across the hundreds of uh, individuals. You don't want to just target recruiting those 10 to 20,000 in that one type of cancer because it's only going to be good for that one mm. type of cancer. You want the 10 million where you, now you can sample and start covering this entire space of, mm. of uh, disease. And it, it could be possible as well that once you get the 10 million, you decide, well, we really need to get the 100 yes. million. And then eventually we just want all the data. Everybody. <laughs> That's fascinating. So you mentioned the software and uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is very important in this process, right? And so the one side is the data, which we discussed. There are many complications to getting it. There's regulation. Actually, let's before we get to the to the software, what are the regulatory hurdles that you guys are dealing with? And also, maybe what are you doing also on the business development side to acquire this data where it exists? And one more thing that I was thinking about when you were speaking is how useful will it be to be able to track these people over their lifetime? And that gets to the point of informed consent and being able not just to have the really great data now that covers all the bases you're describing, but being able to go back to the well and update the phenotypes. Yeah. So on the first point, I mean, DNA, the sequencing of DNA and conveying to individuals risk information or, you know, even paternity, who you know, are the parents you think are, your, are they your parents? Uh, your disease risk and so on, like that's heavily regulated. And it's heavily regulated. And the state of New York is the most heavily regulated of all the states in the US. And the New York Department of Health requires pre-market approval of any genomic test on any citizen of uh, New York that's going to convey you know, medical information back to the individual. So it's, you know, so you have to go through the same kind of FDA regulatory hurdles, you know, that you would have to if you're if you're making a drug or or some other device. So it's something that, you know, definitely exists. It is a high hurdle. It makes some sense in that, you know, DNA does identify who you are. You don't want people basing decisions on their health care, their choice of drugs, you know, for therapeutic uh, for treatments you know, based on information that's not correct or we don't know the confidence of it and so on. So there's some rationale for why that's why that's true. You know, so that's why one of the strategies for Semaphore in, you know, engaging individuals in this information is built up around testing of individuals in a clinically relevant context. So for example, we carry out on think of a pregnancy journey for mom where she wants to become pregnant, what's the first kind of test she might have mm. is a carrier screening test, which mm. is going to say, do you carry mutations that you may pass on mm. to your child that could cause really bad disease? So you should be aware of that. Mm. And especially if your partner, reproductive uh, partner, carries the same kind of bad mutation, then you're at super high risk of having a baby with, with a disease that, again, you should be counseled around. Like, what does that mean? And and this is known as genetic counseling when it's people... genetic counseling, right? So you're counseling the individual around that, and and then once the baby, once the fetus is is in play in the woman, you have non-invasive prenatal testing, and that's to look at uh, are there any really bad, gross DNA changes that are going to lead to catastrophic disease, and then the baby's born, and you have newborn screening to say can we aid in the diagnosis of diseases that would facilitate more rapid treatment, so you have a better outcome. For the kids. So we have a very natural point of engagement of individuals that are going through, say, a pregnancy journey to engage them in that testing, counsel them around the results, but then also educate them about the utility of that data beyond that, that specific journey. So, so the idea is to form longitudinal, longer-term relationship with that individual to track you know, everything that's going on in their lives over time. You know, as the rate of knowledge is changing, the interpretation of the genomes change, we can update them on, hey, we told you this, you know, two years ago, but, you know, the current state of knowledge says this, and it may change guidance around, you know, their risk of disease or, you know, or the risk of their child developing a disease and how you might intervene and prevent that disease from occurring. So that's our strategy is one of engaging patients longitudinally in their journey hmm. and sort of maintaining this relationship with them to guide you know, guide them as the states of knowledge change, as the amount of data we can acquire around them changes, and as our models become better. 
because the acquisition of data is also the method by which you acquire that data directly, new data, is a product as well of Semaphore. Yeah, it's a good point on whether that's a product or not. Our sort of position is that when a patient has data generated on them, say within a health system, uh, they go to the physician's office and they have data generated on them. When we generate DNA sequence data on them for these tests, that my view is the patient should own that data. That's their data. Mm. And what we want to do is enable patients to take control of their own data, help them manage that in a way that they don't have to have a PhD in computer science to do it, right, with tools that are easy to, to use where they can dictate where do they want that data, who do they want the data shared with. Uh, as they flip from health system to health system or they move, can they share that information with their new physician? Basically, just enable them to, to have that kind of control. And sure, we would like a non-exclusive sort of hmm. rights back to the data to help you know, aggregate it, build better models that we can feed back into the diagnostic engine to make better interpretations of the information. So uh, that's the model we're, we're Listening after. to you talk, I don't know if I've ever encountered a more complex business than, <laughs> than the businesses in this field. I mean, you've got massive challenges to overcome, for sure two, if not three or more areas. I mean, just business-wise, that I wasn't even thinking about the regulatory stuff. I mean, you've got so many challenges and so many fronts. I mean, it's just amazing. Well, it's important to point out that we, so while Semaphore is a new company, we're not a startup. The enterprise I built at Mount Sinai, at the Mount Sinai Health System, Icon School of Medicine. And so we had this, you know, existing business where we are performing these tests and carrier screening and non-invasive prenatal testing and cancer genomics. And so those are tests that we run during the course of somebody's care, and those are actually reimbursed. So we actually get reimbursed through payers, insurance companies, on those tests for those individuals. So it's so again, the, one of the beauties of Semaphore is we're not having to buy the data like some companies are having to do. We're we're actually generating the data in the course of somebody's care. We're getting reimbursed for that. Mm. Uh, but the investment, and you're right, <laughs> there's a lot of complexity. Is you know building the big data store to manage all the information, to compute on it, to drive predictive models that can then go back and inform. Um, and that is an expensive game. Like that's not, you know, to hire teams of data scientists. You guys have hundreds of people uh, working for you, right? I mean, I mean, well, we have, uh, you know, Semaphore will start with about 300 people, but we feel like, you know, we're going to need in the hundreds of data scientists if we really want to mine the data deeply enough to derive all the most meaningful insights. I, I use like Tesla. Tesla is an example of, I think they have on the order of four to 500 data scientists that are doing nothing but looking at the sensory data coming off the Tesla cars to improve the autopilot. What we're trying to do is far more complicated than improving the autopilot. So Because it's a more complex system. Because it's a more complex system. So so one could argue that, yeah, you need to, to run at scale on this information side. You need to be at the hundreds. And the four to 500 that Tesla has today, that's more than the sum total of all data scientists across all the health systems in the, in the U.S. So again, nobody's really thinking about the scale you have to run at to be you know, successful or derive meaningful insights from from all of that big data. And that takes big investment, you know, to, to do. And we're going to get into that, too, because that's so important. Because at the end of the day, you can have all the data in the world, but knowing what question to ask and what to look for is really the key. And I would love to ask you about, about that. It's a good point. You know, I have to just say, when Go we ahead. were out pitching to raise money, I was sort of selling the, if we build this big data store, they will come. And we have this business, we're making money. And and the, one of the investors said back to me, and he goes, you know, do you remember Ask Jeeves? And I immediately oh, I, I remember remembered, <laughs> I remembered, but you haven't heard of Ask Jeeves since, and since you remembered it. And, and Ask Jeeves at one time had more data indexed on the internet than Google, so had this big information store, but didn't, didn't have the right way to engage the information mm. and query it and provide meaningful, you know, enough meaning back to, to motivate people to use it. So you're right, you need to, you need to have the right questions to ask and data is not going to say anything to you you have to and what's also fascinating listening to you talk is really appreciating how brand new this whole field is and like yeah. how it's just it's so coming together rapidly and there's so much opportunity for for people and companies who are asking the right questions have the right solutions Re remarkable so let's get a little deeper into the software so tell me a little bit about that like in general, you guys are looking for correlations, but tell me, let right. me understand a little bit better how that process works to the extent that you could even talk about your software. Yeah, so think of, again, we're generating lots of information on people. So think for each person, we have a column and a big feature table, and each of the rows 
are hundreds of thousands of rows that are all the different variables we're measuring on that individual, whether it's changes in DNA, RNA levels, protein levels, metabolite levels, glucose levels, weight, blood pressure, pollen count exposure, like so, so as many things as you can think. And then what do you want to do with those hundreds of thousands of rows in each column? Well, you want to link them to lots of columns, lots of individuals, because across populations of individuals, you're going to be able to start understanding how do these variables relate to one another? Like how correlated are these you know, two variables with each other? How do they correlate with everything else? So when you start thinking about how do you tackle that kind of problem, you start thinking in terms of networks. So a network is simply a graphical model where each node, each unit in the network represents one of those hundreds of thousands of features. And the edges in the network, the connections between those nodes, you know, represent a degree of relatedness between those. How correlated are they through the population? So this is the have. visualization component. This it's like- visualization, but it also reflects, it's visualizing statistical model underneath. So the, and I don't want to get <laughs> too off the rails here, but it, <laughs> but you can view a network as a joint probability function where the what you're looking for is the probability that you're in a state giving these hundreds of thousands of variables of information. So that's a pretty complicated probability function. And what we do is we come up with network-based algorithms, statistical algorithms that try to decompose that very complicated function into easier units that we can actually tackle on the, on the computer. So all, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is say, what's the interconnectedness? What's the topology? of all of these variables that may inform on disease, and that topology helps inform us, like what are the subunits that are actually driving disease X? What's the different topology that may be driving disease Y? What's the components that enhance wellness, and so on? So it's this big statistical model that you can then query to start asking questions about what happens if I move this node no, that's in so a certain exciting. direction. So it's cool. So it's a, <laughs> so think of it as a simulation. Ultimately, what we're doing is simulating the molecular state of the system on the computer and allowing biologists, instead of doing the lab experiment of, of knocking a gene out in a mouse, which takes you know months and, and then phenotyping it, you can carry that out in seconds on that computer by by doing in silico perturbations on this representative model of the system. So that's the kind of goal we're trying to And that's achieve. actually something that other sciences have had for a long time. I mean, in physics, uh, we qu- model right, the yes. world before we ever actually try to conduct experiments. This is, you're trying to do the same thing for medicine. Perfect, so it, it's absolutely right. You know, when when the Hadron Collider generates the petabytes of data that it generates, the physicists, they don't go in de novo, reconstruct all the laws of physics, right? They project that information onto existing models and assess the degree to which the models worked and predicted what they thought and didn't work. And when it doesn't work, they're coming up with new theories, new hypotheses, new ways of modeling. In biology, health of biomedical sciences absolutely has to evolve to that sort of harder quantitative science like physics, climatology, even quantitative finance. Like we have to start storing knowledge and understanding, not in papers, uh, but in, in statistical models, you know, that can be queried, they can be assessed for accuracy, they can be refined, they can be adapted, they can learn, like that's the, that's the path we have to go. And that's what Semaphore is trying to push, you know, one of the first waves of doing that. Creating a really robust model that's predictive. Creating or a first instance of a robust model that's predictive, but also adaptive and can learn as the data builds, as we see more of the outcomes, we can go back and refit the model, make adjustments, and that the model should just get better and better over time. So the same sort of bottlenecks, is it fair to say the same bottlenecks, impediments, whatever you may call it, on the software side that you face are those that any data science company like Google or Facebook is facing? It's really on the progression of of artificial intelligence and machine learning? Yeah, I, I think it's close. I think the difference between like what Google, a Google would do, where they're primary aim with all the information is is more around classification. It's how can we predict, you know, what group do you look like given all the features Mm. and then what will you respond to if I send you this ad? Whereas what we're trying to do is learn the fundamental rules of biology. So we're trying to get at mechanism, actually come up with models that describe the mechanistic underpinnings of the system that then can go on to offer, you know, sort of the predictive components that we need to to actually 
do better treatments, diagnosis of disease. Within that process, are you able to determine causation? Yeah. In fact, one of my focuses over the last you know 15 plus years has been how do you go from correlation to causation? And you know most of the network reconstruction algorithms that people employ, you know, just just look at correlative information, and there are you know many problems with trying to go from correlation to causation because the way information can be structured, you can have multiple different models, multiple ways of of relating variables that are statistically indistinguishable from one another. No matter how much data you have, you're not going to be able to resolve it. So you need some kind of like perturbation to kind of break that symmetry and then observe what what's the most likely causal relationship. And what I had helped pioneer, you know, 15 or so years ago was leveraging DNA variation, so changes in your DNA as a perturbation source to understand how these hundreds of thousands of variables are causally connected. So changes in DNA, as we discussed in the beginning, cause changes in the function of a protein. The changes in the function of that protein cause a cascade. They cause changes in the way a cell functions, changes in the way the tissue functions, changes in your physiological state, your risk of disease, and so on. So we can now monitor that cascade and employ these advanced algorithms that you know can consider DNA as a perturbation source and through some sophisticated mathematics start making causal, you know, causal inferences from this correlative data. That was one of the I think big advances in being able to go from this high dimensional, high dimensional descriptive correlative data to actually causal mechanistic models of disease. What are some of the most interesting insights you've had in the last few years in this process? I think the biggest most fundamental one would be that diseases are caused by perturbations to networks, not single genes. Changes. Changes. So this, you know, this was something. So think of a drug company. Like what do all the drug companies, what's their main aim? Is to find a single disease gene protein to build a single small molecule to target that and thus correct the disease. And what we've seen over the last decades is that has there have been some successes, but by and large, that's fundamentally failed. And the work we were carrying out showed why did that fail is because it's not any single gene or defect that's typically causing these common diseases. It's sort of changes in the states of these networks, which are caused by many different genes and changes in those genes and impacts from the environment. So if and you want the feedback to, of the medication too, that's got to be interesting. Feedback angle. of the med- right. So all of those elements that you can imagine that your medication the viral pathogens you're exposed to, the bacterial pathogens you're exposed to, the pollution levels, like all of that is having an impact on And changing itself. And changing itself. So you need to be in this fluid dynamic modeling state to actually, you know, achieve that understanding. And that's really a fundamental difference from the reductionist sort of biology that drove the last hundred years, which says if, you know, the central dogma of biologists was, you know, DNA to RNA to protein. And I would say the new dogma is constellations of DNA combined with environment, altering networks of molecular states that go on to, you know, change functions. Embracing complexity, complexity theory. Embracing complexity. Yeah, Yeah. which is something we see across a lot of disciplines. Yeah. And on this show, we talk about it a lot in the context of economics as well. Yeah. As a sort of a a way of understanding economies and financial markets that Newtonian, the neoclassical models of economics miss. Perfect. And I would say biology is definitely a latecomer to that to that complexity and arguably uh, the most complex and arguably the most complex absolutely uh, what's going on with wearable technology and i know that there are apple has some type of api that it shares with with companies like you Mm -hmm. what is the opportunity there in terms of being able to get real-time data from people yeah i think it's huge because if you think about you know, there's lots of sophistication in the doctor's office. So you go to the doctor's office and they now have lots of equipment and can run lots of tests. But So what's the problem? The problem is how often are you in that doctor's office? You're in that doctor's Hopefully doc- not often. Right. Hopefully not often <laughs> for the normal person, maybe once a year. And you're maybe spending five minutes of that year talking to that physician. Like, what can they possibly learn on you outside of you have something really majorly wrong going on and so you need help? You don't have this longitudinal tracking over time for what's happening in in your system. So you go and you have your blood pressure measured once. You have glucose levels measured, measured once. What the wearable technologies are now enabling for the first time is this longitudinal collection, high density collection of this information that's gonna set 
a way more appropriate baseline for you to personalize like what deviations should the physician care about in you as opposed to the physician trying to group you into this big population and say, are you an outlier in the population? And if you are, it's usually something very bad is going on. So it's allowing us to you know, check, you know, do your blood pressure five, 10 times a day, you know, check your weight every day. You, you can wear these watches where it's looking at pulse oximetry, your oxygen levels every day, your heartbeat, your heart rates, your activity levels, your sleep patterns, like all of this information that we've been unable to longitudinally assess for cheap before is now possible. Think back to my words on we need really high dimensional data built up around people to make sense of the genome. Like that's the data I'm talking about. The fact that these sensors now provide a low cost way to collect lots and lots of information over time, never really been able to be done before, will change the face of how we, you know, how we are able to understand the states of an individual, their risk of disease, the subtypes of disease, and so on. Oh, and also the time domain aspect is huge, huge because that's something that you can't obtain through any type of, even with the greatest sort of just beautifully matched phenotypic and genotypic data, a snapshot can't even begin exactly. to, to capture. Exactly right. And that's going to be, you know, that is the beauty of this. And you'll hear a lot of complaining from others who do a lot of them not wanting this world to come. Well, these devices are like recreational grade. They're research grade. They're not FDA approved. They shouldn't be used for guiding clinical care. That may be true if you're looking at sort of an absolute measure, like that one snapshot in the doctor's office. You need to, that to be nearly 100% accurate so the physician can interpret it. But if you're collecting over time, you're now setting a baseline where you're not really interested in the absolute level. You're, you're interested in deviations from the baseline to understand you know the individual better. And that you know, deviation from a baseline can tolerate a far higher noise profile where maybe recreation and research grade is fine. Like because longitudinally over time, you're going to beat down, you know, the variation, you're going to beat down the noise and that signal will right, be clear. Exactly. And that hasn't, you know, there are not even many methods, many statisticians working in biomedical and life sciences who know how to handle that kind of data. So I see that as the next big revolution in statistics in the health sciences are like, how do you even accommodate this longitudinal data in you know assessing disease risk and so on and i think what we'll find is that it's just a superior way of, of monitoring it. there's also a huge privacy component here and i imagine also if there weren't proper regulations put in place dangers and concerns for patients clearly if something is discovered in your data what are insurance companies going to do if they have access to that information i don't want to minimize that but in the interest of time i do want to ask you and we can get to that we will I want to ask you what, because we're sitting here and we're talking about, you know, data and models and, you know, all this stuff and business and, but this is really about some aspirational ideas, right? I mean, this is about curing some devastating diseases for anyone that's had to lose someone due to disease or someone that's had to go through something devastating. It's a devastating experience and it's, a, it's no small thing. You're potentially changing people's lives, people that work in this industry. So, I want to ask you that on a very personal level, like what do you see, what is the sort of moonshot directly in front of us, what is over the horizon, just over the horizon, and what is sort of out there that you see in the next 20 years or something? Yeah, I think what is directly in front of us is the ability to now generate for low cost this really high dimensional data, your genome sequence and so on, and the methods do exist to start interpreting that information to guide clinical care in some areas, and cancer you know, no area is more prime for this than cancer. So lots of the more state-of-the-art treatment centers. Explain that a little bit. I'm sorry. Why is, let's be clear about that, why is nothing else more prime for it than cancer? Because cancer is a disease of the genome. So you get cancer because of these changes in your genome, and it's very hard-hitting. You know, it's not subtle like like Alzheimer's changes and diabetes. It it's like fundamentally almost alien. Like your your cells are now doing something that they should never do, and so it's very very easy to see. The signal to noise ratio is incredibly high. The super Moore's law pace of next generation sequencing makes it cheap enough to now generate that on individuals. So it's just the one that's you know the most prime because we can generate the data cheaply, and the insights we can gain from that directly speak to clinical care paths that, that you know a doctor would want the patient to take. All right, so now let's talk in the few minutes we have left. Let's talk a little bit about the hurdles and the concerns around privacy and you know control over data because that's something that we have experienced 
in a negative way in our relationship to Google, to Facebook, to Apple, to all these different companies, to TOS, these terms of service. I mean, our data is just out there. And cybercrime has escalated tremendously. The amount of money that's lost to breaches in cybersecurity is huge. So what are those concerns there, those legitimate concerns that people have around data? Yeah, well, first I would say, you know, the fundamental hurdle, again, going back to the beginning, is just collecting, you know, getting that high enough dimensional data on big enough people for all the modeling to work. Because the future will be, down the road, fully computational models that perfectly simulate the human system. You don't ever see the software being a bottleneck, in other words. You think the data is always going to be behind the software? I think the data will be behind the software and that we're sort of at this scale now. We're, you know, managing you know, zettabytes of data, computing on that scale of data, like building, testing these models. Like that's definitely not a completely solved problem, but it's far enough where the biggest bottleneck today is having the right data around around the people. So your point on the privacy and the problems with, you know, unauthorized release or how companies are going to use that information, what control does the individual have are all very real because we need people to want to participate. So I see us, unlike a Google or any other, we're sort of picking on Google, but there are many, you know, Yahoo, Amazon, Facebook, Facebook, they're all the same. You know, you have this digital click-through consenting. So you're presenting somebody with pages of consenting information that nobody reads, and mm. they're allowed to just click through it without thinking about it. And we all do that because we don't want to take the time to read the fine print, and we're getting some kind of meaningful service back. Like with Google, like I use Gmail, and it's a good service because I can send big attachments. It stores things forever, and it works. And um, so I do the click through and don't think about it because I'm, I want that service. Well, on the health side, you know, we're not even really allowed to do that, you know, from a regulatory standpoint. Like you have to inform, you have this concept of informed consent. Which is meaningful understanding. Which is right, giving the individual and ensuring they understand what they're actually consenting to. If a Google had that obligation, they would need to be telling you, hey, we actually own the data that you're typing out in your emails, and we can use that for whatever purpose mm-hmm. we want. You know, maybe more people wouldn't be so agreeable to accept those conditions. But I think it would have evolved in a better way. The right kind of yin and the yang would have been more, more engaged, right. For us, it's all, it's all about like just appropriately consenting the individual, informed consent, and then enabling them to take control of that information mm-hmm. and let them decide, knowing all of the risk, like who do you want to share it with and for what purpose? Like you just give them that kind of control, and then it becomes their responsibility. Of course, we also have a responsibility to protect that data, to encrypt it, to ensure that it's not easily compromised and there the best we can do is using the state of the art, you know, industry standards on how you go about that and having competent, you know, IT staff where we've invested very heavily in IT and, you know, big platform data. Do you see any promise for sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Do you see any promise for blockchain as a, a technology to help own and uh, disseminate this data and control it as an individual? Yeah, absolutely. Like, love the idea of the blockchain protocols. I think there are a few obstacles that I know several companies are now trying to overcome. One of them being privacy with those with the blockchain protocols. Everything's sort of exposed and everybody's kind of helping yeah. uh, validate. And what does that mean in the context of highly personal health-related information? So I think there's some, some hurdles there that I know others, but I view that as one of the types of technologies that could you know, really help in protecting an individual's information. You're saying it would be difficult to create anonymity within the distributed ledger of trying to have so many different computers share in that process? Yeah, that kind of information is seeable by the community that Mm. has access to those ledgers and are doing the validations and, like, how much information is sort of accessible there and will inform on an individual, like, that's still unclear, like, I think. So, obviously, Eric, you're a brilliant guy. No need to beat around the bush on that. I can assume, given the work you do and your general curiosity, you must have some interesting ideas and thoughts around artificial intelligence and where that is going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like I'm you know super mixed on it because on the one hand, I know a lot of what we're doing. If we get to this simulated system, that that is going to usher in a new era. You know, from designer babies, like we're, we will be able to understand what changes do we make to tune these different functional characteristics of the system. There's societal implications for that. Like, how do we not create a bigger divide between the haves and the haves not? Right, the access to this technology, the application and reproductive health, end stage disease and aging. Like, how do we not let that benefit the fact that's, that only people the with wealthy? More, right. 
you know, that are we going to create these super classes that they live forever and have the most amazing, you know, kids. And then everybody else is is a million miles away from that, but having to now serve that, like, I think that's just, there's the potential, like, unless we as humans become far more purposeful about these changes that we're making, these, these technologies we're ushering in and how they come together, that, you know, we may very well get a world that we don't. These are real challenges you're describing. And, and in fact, I'm not sure exactly how one would go about that, because even within the context of an agreement to regulate and to create a regulatory framework, because of the nation state model, you have countries like China that could do something completely different. And in fact, there is a concern, I'm sure, within your industry, which is we want to be competitive with companies that are in other countries Absolutely. with different regulations. And so there's this tension between what you need in order to make the advancements you want in order to achieve these ends, and then also the long long-term fat tails. Yeah, and that's why I think, you know, doing these kinds of shows, education, like I think we need to get more people thinking because we, me as scientist and, you know, the one who wants to drive this hard because we do want to help people. And so we're, we're being purposeful in one dimension, but we're not understanding how it's going to affect these other thousand dimensions. And so you need more people thinking about that, more people understanding. You need legislators and you know, regulatory bodies and academic centers, like how are we going to sort of transform the state of understanding and democratize it is kind of where I hope a lot of the, you know, activity over the next few years kind of takes off to start giving us a shot at getting our head around it. I don't think it's an easy question. I mean, many yeah. in our audience know I had a brain tumor and I had surgery and radiation from it. And even given that experience, I mean, granted, if someone came to me today and said, Dimitri, you have a brain tumor, you have six months to live, but if you sign this here, you know, all these changes will happen and you will be cured. Well, of course, I would take it. But in the context of having gone through that and knowing what that's like, even then, I'm mixed on this subject yeah. because I am very concerned about it and for many reasons. You touched on some of them dealing with the incremental effects of this wealth disparity, but there's also the larger question of general AI, which would just, which is a whole other. And it may be, you know, ultimately the ultimate democratizing end may be that we all enter digital space. <laughs> like we all, <laughs> well, like right? Well. We're, we're all, you know, things become digitized and, you know, maybe we're in a simulation we're, now. We're... <laughs> and, but maybe that is, you know, if we, and I have been somewhat persuaded by that given the amazing progress in immersive VR and, you know, so who knows, like there's reason to be optimistic <laughs> if that came to be, then all of a sudden, you know, everybody's having sort of access to that type of avenue. But I, I think over the next couple of decades, it's going to be a real fascinating thing to watch. Like you are going to see people making direct manipulations, genome editing of the genome to enhance characteristics that aren't just disease based, because that technology we developed to treat disease can be equally applied to enhance characteristics that people may think are advantageous, better looking, more physically fit, you know, smarter, better memory. And like, how do we, you know, get our heads around that? And it's got to be more people thinking about it. It's got to be more legislators thinking. It's got to be educational centers thinking about it. And we have to collectively come to, come to a higher level, a higher IQ as a society, or we're gonna, unknown how we'll we'll handle this this big divide between the haves and haves not. If that gets bigger, it's gonna lead to instability. It's not gonna be a place we want to be. Do you ever watch the old Star Treks? Like I, the I 60s do. ones. Remember yes. the con being the super yes. race of people yep, yep. from the 90s, though? That exactly. Was, so yeah. we've already passed that. Right. Dr. Eric Schott, thank you so much for coming. Well, on. thank you, Dimitri. All right. I really appreciate a it. A pleasure. And that was my episode with Dr. Eric Schott. I want to thank Dr. Schott for being on my program. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforcespod.com. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforcespod.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Hey.